In the 8th century in China, influential poet Li Bei was a trendsetter. He wrote, In the middle of the small artificial lake rises a green and white porcelain pavilion, reached by a jade bridge that arches like a tiger's back. In this pavilion, some friends clad in light dress drink cups of warm wine together. During the 17th century at France, King Louis XIV ordered his architect, Louis Laveau and gardener André Lenot, to produce a tiny pleasure palace in the grounds of Versailles, near his artificial lake. Built to practice the arts of seduction, the Trianon de Porcelain was lavishly embellished with ceramics in the Chinese taste. The beautiful design style chinoiserie was the ultimate outcome and expression of a peculiar preference for pagodas, porcelains and priceless possessions, passionately pursued for over four centuries in England and Europe. Our delightful early 18th century porcelain group are undeniably exotic, but recognisable as respected members of a civilised, well-bred society. They are painted with enamels in a family of colours that included famille noir or black and famille vert or green. It was travel stories that began fueling the desire to share some of the magic from that far off exotic land known as Cathay during the 14th century. This was when Sir John Mandeville published his opus called Travels. Translated into 10 languages, his amazing account of a bewildering variety of monsters, some with ears that hung down to their knees and lips so pendulous they could serve as sombreros. They must have all seemed to European and English people as totally mind-boggling. His was a far more fanciful account than that of 14th century Venetian traveller Marco Polo, who devoted page upon page to describing in detail the ancient capital of Cathay. Just after his travels had been published, the open-minded reign of Emperor Kublai Khan that he and his father and uncle had worked with and traded through for over two decades came to an end. The incoming regime closed its doors to the West, entirely due to a resurgence of nationalism and there were many tumultuous years surrounding the establishment of the Ming Dynasty, whose Chinese emperors from 1368 to 1644 sanctioned only a limited trade with the West. By the 18th century, the China trade was expanding again, and fashionable Western society sought to transmit their ideas through a multiplicity of imagery that was all at once fun, fantastic and frivolous, yet quite sophisticated and enchantingly pretty. It manifested itself in intimate interiors, draped delightfully with sumptuous silk textiles with printed scenes of fashion and folly. On the scale of things, a very few people in England and Europe had ever seen someone who was Chinese, so their imagination took over, and when combined with the great layering of charm, chinoiserie was a style that combined flirtation with fantasy, frivolity and folly. Fans were among the earliest imports of the English and Dutch East India companies and they perfectly reflected the femininity associated with this very stylish movement. Chinoiserie had a complete lack of pomposity and it used clear bright colours well. It had both amusing and fantastic qualities about it and displayed a preference for asymmetrical design. This aspect offered everyone a rest from the formality and relentless perfection demanded by the classical repertoire of ancient Greece and Rome, and it became popular because it was about having fun. The French designer Jean-Baptiste Pillemont, 1728-1808, delighted in rendering designs used to paint timber panels lining rooms that were filled with the newly popular small-scale feminine furniture. A writing desk made for King Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour, for her chateau at Bellevue in the first half of the 18th century was painted Prussian blue, the most expensive colour on the planet at the time. 
It was then decorated with this new and enchanting style of decoration, which placed an immediate emphasis on chinoiserie as a style of luxury and refinement. The artists that the Marquise du Pompadour patronised, Francois Boucher, delighted in rendering scenes of the sophisticated pleasures of the beau monde, and a love of things oriental fitted into both the French and English interior décor and garden genres at this time. Surprise was the key to the success of pretty pavilions and fantastic follies. On your journey, your pulse would quicken as you came across some delightful building in which, unlike the house you lived in, that had to conform to a conventional lifestyle and its demands, you could allow your imagination to run free and create a total fantasy. Unlike other styles that deteriorated to be replaced by another, chinoiserie has never really left us. The Western fascination for the East continues and its abiding images have endured, adapted and changed to suit prevailing trends and fashions. These days, it's about a focus on food and the merriment enjoyed with a mingling of cultures and traditions. The plant hunter Robert Fortune recorded in his 1847 publication, Wanderings in China, but the curtain, which had been drawn around the celestial country for ages, has now been rent asunder, and instead of viewing an enchanted fairyland, we find that after all, China is just like other countries. I went to dine with a friend of mine who dined off porcelain plates, of a kind so rare that it stirred your hair to think of their possible fates. For some were Ming and others were Qing, whatever those names may be, and the food was divine and the wine, the wine intoxicated me. There were ices, those were of familiar rose, and coffee of familiar noir, and a choice dessert of familiar vert preceded a choice cigar. But alas for the end of dinner and friend, for he happened his eyes to raise, as I started to rub the burning stub on a bit of his finest glaze. He was perfectly nice, but as cold as ice, as he rang for my coat and hat. For Ming is a thing, and so is Ching, that mustn't be used for that. <laughs> 